you're just getting started with line and wash artwork or you simply love drawing and painting building facades and shop facades and houses, this one is for you. In this real-time video, I am taking you through my entire pen and ink drawing process, sharing all of my favorite techniques that I use to define edges and add details into my drawing with drawing pen to how I move on to adding bright watercolor washes to bring this house piece to life. Some time ago, I shared a step-by-step -step drawing tutorial in which I took you through how to draw this specific house that we're moving on to inking and then painting today. So if you want to practice your drawing and you want to learn about my methodology and all my tips and tricks that I use to draw pretty much any type of house freehand, I would highly recommend checking out that tutorial first and then doing your transferring and then moving on to the pen and ink and the watercolor that I'm going to be sharing in this video. I'll make sure to provide a link to that video down below in the text section of this post. So you can consider that video part one and this one part two if you want to go through the entire process and really practice your drawing and your painting simultaneously with one same piece. I would consider this specific house view helpful for beginners getting started because it is an elevation view of this house and I explain about that in that drawing tutorial. However, I do have more advanced house drawing tutorials where there is two-point perspective taking place and things like that, which I'm going to make sure to link to down below in the recommended resources in case you're a little bit more advanced. If you'd like my outline sketch so that you can skip over the freehand drawing process and simply transfer that onto your watercolor sheet and move on to the parts of the process that I'm going to be sharing in this video, you can go ahead and and grab that via a link that I'm going to be leaving down below for you in the description box. All right, with all that said, let's jump in. What I did after having that freehand sketch prepared on my sketchbook is I used tracing paper to transfer my sketch that I created freehand onto my sheet of watercolor paper. And then I got started with this process from the point that I'm going to be sharing today in this video. So I'm taking out my 0 0.3 tip size drawing pen from Stadler here from this four pack that I got via Amazon. And the objective with this phase of the process is to define edges to add smaller details and textures and I'm also going to be adding some alternative shading to develop some darker values in shadow areas using hatching. So here I'm starting to carefully trace over the line work that I created with graphite. There are some details that I'm going to be adding in at the end of this pen and ink process that I didn't initially add in with pencil. I'm using a combination of making my way downwards as much as I can from the top of the page and also I'm trying to define the outer edges of the largest shapes first and then move on to the medium sized shapes and then the smallest details at the end just as much as possible but at this point in the process what's most important in terms of the order that you're tackling these different elements or sections in is just staying mindful of what area you've just worked on that maybe has fresh ink on it so that you don't accidentally smudge that because if there is any smudging that happens you're not going to be able to fix that because ink is permanent so be careful with that now whatever works for you really if you're left-handed and you want to work from right to left or you're right-handed and you want to work from left to right or you want to work from the top and go downwards or Whatever the case may be for you that's most comfortable, that's perfectly fine. Just work in different sections in an order that is going to facilitate the process for you and is going to make it much more likely that you won't smudge anything. However, generally speaking, it is best to keep your hand off the page. If the bottom of your hand comes into contact with the paper, make sure that it is very, very minimal. Try to lift your forearm up and draw with the entire arm. We're not only trying to avoid smudging any graphite or ink that we might have on the paper, but also we want to protect the integrity of our watercolor sheet and avoid getting any uh, skin oils or any dirt or anything that we might have on our hand on our watercolor paper because if we do get that on there, lotion or whatever it is that we might have, 
in our hands or on our hands later on when we try to paint on this paper those sections that have oils or lotion or whatever it is on them they're not going to take the paint the same way the paint is not going to absorb into that paper the same way and we're going to arrive at splotchy effects whitish sections and textures that we don't necessarily want now, as I am doing all of this, I'm really trying to stay away from the look of thick, super bold outlines. And honestly, the term outline is something that I do my best to stay away from using because when I think of the word outline, I think of coloring book pages that have very thick, black, bold line work with one consistent thickness all throughout the image. And that's definitely not what I'm going for. Um, that can definitely lead to more of a cartoony look. So I like referring to this as defining edges more than outlining. I'm trying to keep my hand and my arm moving and flowing as I am doing this line work with my pen, really embracing any slight wobbles and imperfections that happen. And in many cases, my lines are not even connecting fully and that is perfectly okay. That helps me stay away from the look of outlines. And I'm keeping in mind something that I've mentioned before in past pen and ink tutorials, line weight variation is what I want and all line weight variation refers to is making sure that certain sections of your lines look thinner and lighter and other sections of your lines look thicker and darker and this is again to stay away from that look of a consistent line weight all throughout your image which is going to lead to flatness so making sure that you're keeping it moving is definitely something that will help you. The more slowly you work, the more likely it is that your lines are going to be thicker and bolder and stiffer and heavier overall than when you work a little bit more quickly or at least try to keep it moving. Because if you keep it moving, that ink is not going to have that much time to flow down that tip of the pen and you're going to be creating thinner, more dynamic looking lines. Also, if you work too slowly and you stop in the middle of a line for a second or two and then you keep going, you're likely going to have stop and start dots throughout your line and that's definitely something that you don't want. For me, it's better to have imperfect lines that maybe even have slight wobbles to them but that have a line weight variation to them that make them look more dynamic and flowy than having a super perfect line that is too stiff or too stark. In past pen and ink videos, I've also shared those four variables that you can start exploring so that you can then control more intentionally once you get the hang of this medium, which will help you develop that line weight variation that can create very interesting looking pieces that are very dynamic. One of these variables is what I just mentioned in relation to speed. You want to work relatively quickly or at least don't stop moving. Lay your lines down confidently and in a flowing way. Another thing that you can play with to develop a line weight variation is the angle at which you're using your pen. If you're using your pen in more of a 90 degree angle to your paper, more ink is going to flow down that tip of the pen, which is going to create thicker, bolder lines. And if your pen has more of a 45 degree angle to your paper or a 30 degree angle to your paper, less ink is going to flow down, which creates thinner, lighter lines. Another thing that you can play with and explore is the pressure that you're exerting on your pen. And at no point am I really pressing down my pen very hard at all on my paper. I either use my pen lightly or even more lightly, but it is important to just take into account that the more swiftly you move your pen on your paper and the less you press down, the lighter the line, the more you press down, the bolder the line. And finally, of course, you can also bring in multiple pen tip sizes so that you can perhaps use your larger tip size for maybe the outer edges of the shape and maybe the smaller tip size for textures or details that you're going to be adding inside of that larger shape. Because that way, of course, your larger pen tip size is going to enable you to more easily create thicker, bolder lines, and you can bring in your smaller pen tip size for thinner, lighter lines. However, the more you develop your control over this drawing tool, the more easily you're able to develop 
thicker lines and thinner lines with just one same pen tip size. But sometimes it is worth having different pen tip sizes on hand. It all depends on the style that you're going for and your own personal way of working. All right, so at this point in the process, I'm really starting to get into the smaller shapes and details. I've already worked on all the larger shapes and medium sized shapes, at least inside of the house. I'm still missing the electricity post on the left, but I'm going to leave that until the end. Here I'm getting started with creating that brick or stone texture in this top third of the house. You can see how I'm not perfectly drawing little rectangles to describe this texture. These are more like little marks that I'm creating that resemble a rectangle, but most of them are not even enclosed shapes. And I'm just making sure to place these in a very irregular way, meaning I'm not creating any organized patterns and keeping everything very asymmetrical. And also that I'm not going overboard with the amount of these marks that I'm adding in this area. And especially because we're bringing in two different mediums, this is a mixed media piece because we're combining pen and ink with watercolor, we don't want to overly describe with either. We want to create a nice balance using the two mediums. Whenever I'm working on a mixed media piece or a piece where I'm going to be using two or more different drawing or painting mediums so that I don't arrive at an overly described or overworked piece. Maybe in this case I want to do 50-50 or 60-40 or 70-30. You know, that is completely up to you and again, the style that you like and the way that you like to work. But I think it's huge to give thought to how much you want to do or describe with each medium. And that's really going to help you stay away from doing too much with, with both and arriving at a piece that is just too overwhelming to look at too heavy and that lacks that glow and that looseness that we're looking for. I'm now creating the texture in the front wall of the house in the lower two thirds. And these are just straight horizontal lines. But especially with these texture lines, I make sure to add these in even quicker than the definition of edges that I did for the larger uh, general shape. I want these lines to be thinner and lighter and maybe even more broken in certain sections. So I bring in those variables that I was mentioning before. I am now making sure to use my drawing pen in more of a 30 to 35 degree angle from my paper. I'm making sure to work even more quickly and I'm making sure to use my pen very, very lightly on my paper. And this creates very thin, lighter looking lines overall. With this specific texture, I am trying my best to create uh, relatively straight horizontal lines. I am starting with drawing a section of that line in this left larger area of this front wall and then continuing that same line in the more narrow, smaller shape for that front wall on the right. This is going to help me create the same amount of lines on the left larger shape and in that very narrow shape on the right. And it also helps me make sure that these lines are going to be relatively aligned. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and add in a few extra small details in the house. I feel these smaller details that we're adding in at this point in the process are a lot easier because you're using those previous lines and shapes that you've already developed and are just adding another line alongside that line or adding a smaller shape that's exactly the same as that larger shape that you created inside of that larger shape. I wanted to add some amount of detail to make the piece a little bit more interesting to look at, but I'm still taking little breaks and seeing everything as a whole and making sure that I'm not going overboard with anything. The smaller and smaller that I get with my shapes and textures and details, the more I tend to bring in my artistic license to change things up. It's not necessary to try to recreate everything exactly the same as you see it in that reference photo. And we're going to see this even more with the color work that we're going to be doing later. I completely change the color of the house and the elements around the house. In that video in which I share my freehand drawing process for this house, I explain how I decided to bring in this electricity post, which doesn't even appear in that reference photo. 
we do see some electricity cables or lines in that reference photo, but not a post. And I really like the addition of electricity lines in front of a house illustration or painting like this. I think it adds an extra detail. I think it adds personality to the piece. But I didn't like the location and the length of the cables in that photo. So I decided to bring an entire electricity post in and to change the lines for those cables. And what I did was I added in that electricity post from Imagination after seeing some photos of electricity posts on Google. One thing that I want to mention here is we have pretty long vertical lines along the edges of this electricity post. And I just wanted to mention that I don't force myself to draw those very long lines with one consistent single stroke. You can see how those um, edges for that electricity post were tackled in separate lines and sections. And the same thing goes for these long electricity lines, these kind of curved lines that I added in front of the house. I also tackled those in kind of longish sections. I have found that this helps me avoid um, larger, more prominent wobbles that I probably don't want when I force myself to draw very long lines. Okay, so I'm all done with that electricity post and I am now getting started with the alternative shading technique that I am bringing in for this pen and ink process. So what I am using for this one is just regular hatching. Hatching is just groups of parallel lines that can be laid down with any kind of slant or diagonal. I just picked a angle to lay down those lines in and I continued laying down parallel lines using that same angle side by side. I have created entire videos explaining about different alternative shading techniques that you can learn about to add to your repertoire so that when you are drawing with pen and ink, you have more to choose from and you kind of pick the ones that you feel will work best for the piece on hand. I will make sure to leave links to those resources down below in the text section of this post in case you'd like to check them out and work on those very helpful exercises. But for this one, I just picked regular hatching and all I am doing here is I am adding a little bit of a shadow effect, developing a little bit of a darker value under roof ledges, inside of windows, and underneath some elements or little structures that I feel would create a shadow on a section of the plane underneath it or around it. So wherever you feel that part of this compound structure for this house would impede that light from hitting a section of wall or whatever it is that is underneath it or to the side of that thing, you can go ahead and add hatching in that area of shadow. The closer you create your lines when you're doing hatching or cross hatching, the more paper you cover up and this creates a darker value. The more space you leave in between your lines, the more paper remains uncovered with ink and this creates a lighter value. So depending on how dark you want your shadow area, you can consider creating lines that are closer together or farther apart. All right, so I'm just finishing up with the very last pen and ink details that I want to make sure to add in before moving forward. So for the most part, I'm just adding in extra lines and textures using the shapes and the lines that I already have laid down. Little sections of wall that I'm able to see through the window, a little bit of a cast shadow in front of the house where the house is blocking that light from hitting sections of the sidewalk right underneath it. A very, very light hatching under this electricity box on the post, and I'm all done. So I allowed everything to dry completely for around 15 to 20 minutes, and I've never had any issues with these pigment liners from Sadler. Their ink dries pretty fast, so that time should be enough for the entirety of that ink to dry completely. But what I like to do before getting started with the painting process is I like bringing out my graphite eraser and very gently and carefully erasing out all of that graphite that is still visible through the pen and ink. 
and this is because once we paint over that graphite that graphite is not going to be able to be erased so I like doing this before getting started with the water coloring all right so I erased out all that graphite and many times I use that absorbent towel that I'm going to be using for my painting process to dust off those eraser bits of course, the absorbent towel at this point is completely dry, so that's that's very important. But I like using the absorbent towel instead of my hand because, again, I'm avoiding touching my watercolor paper with my hand as much as possible. And with that, it's time to get started with preparing our different color mixtures that we're going to be using for the painting process. I'm going to be using my size 10 round brush to create these color mixtures because it's a size that is comfortable for me. It fits very well in these wells that my paint is in and I'm able to bring out enough water from my container into my color mixtures whenever I need to, etc. It's just a great size. It's very important that you prepare your paintbrush bristles to take on paint by swiveling your paintbrush in your container of water and pre-wetting those paintbrush bristles. Bring out a little bit of water at a time from your container and into your paint pans. Swivel your paintbrush on top of that paint to activate that and bring a little bit of paint at a time into your mixing area. Repeat this process as needed until you have enough paint slash water in your little puddle. I'm going for nice juicy color mixtures here. Somewhere between a coffee to milk-like consistency is what I am looking for, meaning I want a good amount of pigment but also water in my color mixtures. Something around 50% paint, 50% water would be appropriate. All right, so this slightly muted down blue that I'm creating for myself is a mixture of phthalo blue and a bit of neutral tint. I'm going to be using this blue to paint the walls of the house and I'm also going to be using it for the sky. I make sure to completely rinse out the previous color for my paintbrush bristles before getting started with creating my next color. The next little puddle of color that I'm going to be preparing for myself is my dark gray that I'm going to be using for certain design elements in the house which are going to be white. We need to develop some light gray values throughout the white detailing in the house so that those white details don't have one flat white color all throughout. And I'm going to be using the same exact gray, only in a more saturated, less watered down state, to paint the black sections of the house. The roof, black detailing, and also the sidewalk in front of the house. So the way that I create this gray is by mixing together ultramarine blue and burnt umber. Ultramarine blue and brown, whether it's burnt umber or burnt sienna or sepia or Van Dyke brown, anything like that, blue and brown is just a great color combination that creates very interesting, vibrant looking grays. And it's very versatile as well because you can shift its temperature by simply changing the ratios of your brown and your blue in your color mixture. If you have more brown than blue in it, it's gonna look like a dark brown. And if you have more blue than brown in it, it's gonna look like a dark blue. Right now, I'm going for a 50-50 of each color so that I can create a gray. So you can see how I created that dark gray that is gonna be perfect to use in all these areas that I just mentioned. And now I'm gonna be creating a couple of different browns, which I'm gonna be using for the electricity posts and also for the door. First, I am creating my lighter brown, which is just plain burnt umber with a little bit of water added in. And on the left of that, I'm going to create a darker version of my burnt umber by adding some neutral tint into it. So you're going to notice that my second brown that I create is a deeper, darker, chocolatey brown. This is going to help me create more dimension, a sense of light and shadow into these brown elements by dropping in a little bit of my darker brown into the lighter brown while it's still wet, I can create some shadow sections. All right, so here are these first four colors swatched out for you on paper so that you can see what they look like. You never have to use the exact colors that I am using, just use whatever you have on hand that will allow you to create colors that are similar to mine and you're gonna do great. Okay, so before moving forward, I also want to create a couple of different greens for myself because I'm going to be adding a couple of little shrubs 
on either side of the house. For these plants, I want to make sure that I have a lighter green and a darker green. So this is where I bring out my undersea green, which is a very deep, dark, rich green already by itself. My darker green is going to be plain undersea green with some water added in. And then my lighter green is going to be undersea green plus Hansa yellow light. I'm going to swatch out these two greens on this extra scrap piece of watercolor paper that I have right here so that you can see what they look like. And with these greens, we are going to be all set to get started. I do want to mention before moving on, this is by no means all of the paint that we're going to be using throughout the painting process. I'm definitely going to be making more of these colors along the way and maybe even slightly shifting the ratios of the colors in the mixtures that have a combo of two colors in them. Or I'm going to be adding water into these color mixtures to water them down and use that color in a paler, more translucent state. When we're painting with watercolor, we're constantly shifting and changing the color ratios in our mixtures as well as the paint to water ratios in our color mixtures depending on what it is that we're doing. But by just having chosen the specific colors that I'm going to be using for the different areas in this piece, I know exactly which colors I'm going to be reaching out for, what I need to make more, and there is no guessing involved. I know exactly what I need to do to create the colors that I need. All right, so with my initial color mixtures ready, I change my water because after having prepared all of these different color mixtures, my water was pretty murky. And I want to make sure that I get started with clean water and that I keep an eye on how murky or dirty my water is becoming so that I can change it immediately because this can definitely affect how vibrant my colors look. All right, so have a look at this quick little test I'm going to be doing on this scrap piece of watercolor paper here with my blue color mixture. This is my size 16 round brush, by the way. This is the first brush that I'm going to be using during the painting process. And what I'm going to do right here is first I'm going to paint in a light blue shape with this blue color mixture. I made sure to take just a little bit of that blue from that upper section of that slope where I had just a little bit of paint. And then while that initial light blue layer is still wet, I drop in more of the same blue color mixture into a couple of points there, which creates deeper dark blue value, smaller areas inside of the lighter blue shape and because I dropped it into that first layer while that first layer was still wet I was left with my soft transitions between my darker blue and my lighter blue. Why? Because watercolor is always going to expand and create nice soft blurred out transitions when you drop it into wet paper. When you want sharp edges around your shapes or the details that you add in then you have to make sure that you're painting on dry paper. So this little demonstration that I did on my scrap piece of watercolor paper is exactly the same thing that I'm going to be doing throughout all of these large shapes for this house initially, for all of these different sections throughout the house. So I am getting started with the blue wall in front of the house. So using my size 16 round brush, I am starting to paint in that initial light blue layer all throughout this front wall where I want my blue, making sure that I'm using my paint in a pretty watered down state, taking my color from that upper section in the slope, painting around my windows and other sections where I don't want my blue. And in order to make sure that this initial light blue layer remains wet for longer, so that when I want to drop in more of this blue and create those darker, deeper shadow sections and I get those nice diffused out effects that I'm looking for, where the dark blue turns into the light blue gradually and softly, I need to keep everything wet for longer. So to do this, I make sure to run my paintbrush bristles over this entire shape several times. So as I make my way down, I go back to where I started and I run my paintbrush bristles over that area with a little bit more paint or water even, just to keep it wet for longer. You're going to see me advance a little bit more now towards the right, but I go back to that initial area where I first started. And then I advance a little bit more and I go back to that initial area and so on and so forth to make sure that everything stays nice and wet. 
All you have to do is make sure that you're keeping an eye on the previous blue sections that you've painted as you continue moving forward, filling up that entire shape that you want to paint. And don't allow it to start to dry. And when you're done painting that entire blue shape and everything is still pretty wet, go ahead and drop in more of this blue. Now I'm taking my blue from that lower section of my well where I have the majority of that color and I'm dropping in more of this blue into shadow areas. You can see how because everything is still pretty wet, I am getting nice diffused out effects. I'm making sure to continue to work quickly while everything is still wet and workable because the moment that things start drying on me it is better to allow everything to dry completely and do any darkening that I need to do of shadow areas later on in a separate layer after everything has dried. The more you continue practicing with watercolor the easier it's going to become for you to tell when your paper is starting to dry and when you have to allow it to dry completely before doing any more work. And another important note is when you are trying to paint quickly, it's essential that you have enough color mixture ready for you on your palette so that you can quickly load up your paintbrush and that you're using a paintbrush that is large enough for the area on hand. If you don't have enough color mixture, you're going to have to make more along the way and it's very likely that as you're making more of that color mixture that you need, your paint is going to start drying on you and the moment that you start working again, it's very likely that when you're ready, your paint is already going to be partially dry on your paper. And if you're using a paintbrush that is too small for the area on hand, it's also very likely that you're going to run into trouble because you're not going to be able to quickly load up your paintbrush bristles with enough paint slash water to be able to cover up large sections quickly. Once I was done with painting that front blue wall of the house, it was time to get started with painting my gray for the sidewalk. I removed all of that blue from my paintbrush bristles and still using my size 16 round brush, I loaded up my paintbrush with the gray that I created by combining ultramarine blue and burnt umber. After loading up my paintbrush with a good amount of paint, I started painting in this gray right below the house in that central section of the piece. You can see how I got nice blue bleeds where that blue started bleeding or merging into the gray. This happened because I started painting in the gray while that blue was still wet. I actually really like how this looks but if you don't want bleeding to happen then simply allow that blue to dry completely before you start painting in the gray. Now I knew since before getting started with the painting process that I wanted to go for a vignette-like piece with this one, which means that the majority of the saturation of color is going to be in the center of the piece, and as that color makes its way towards the edges of the piece, it's gonna become paler and paler or lighter and lighter. So when I painted in these grays for the sidewalk, I made sure that the majority of that gray color, the heavily saturated gray was painted right beneath the house and once I felt I had painted enough gray I removed that color from my paintbrush bristles and I just went in with a little bit of water in my paintbrush and kind of pulled a tiny bit of that paint outwards towards the edges while it was still wet. This enabled me to create a nice soft transition a gradient if you will where the gray turns into the whiteness of the paper so it really is just a matter of making sure that you are just placing that paint right under the house, that you're not adding any more paint as you make your way out towards the edges, and that as soon as you feel you have placed enough color on your paper, you remove that color from your paintbrush bristles and you go back in while that gray is still wet, to do that gentle pulling outwards towards the left and the right so that you can create that gradient where the darker gray turns into a lighter gray and that lighter gray turns into the whiteness of the paper. So I created soft transitions that are going towards either sides in that sidewalk and then that lower edge of that gray shape is sharp and defined. Right around here you're going to see me add in a little bit more texture on the sidewalk with a couple of intentional blooms that I'm going to be creating by dropping in a couple of teeny tiny drops of water from my container. Barely touching the tip of my paintbrush to that paper while that gray was still wet 
and you can see how those little drops of water went down the tip of my paintbrush onto that paint that was still wet and disturbed that paint. That water pushed that paint out, creating two blooms and giving this section of the piece a little bit more visual texture. This is completely optional. All right, so after having painted in that gray for my sidewalk, I am getting started with the roof of the house, which is also gray. I'm still using my same brush. This is my size 16 round, and I am using the exact same painting method that I was using for the blue in the house. I am going in initially with this gray in a pretty watered down translucent state. I am making sure to paint quickly. I started on the left of this shape because that is just what's comfortable for me as a right handed person but you can start wherever you'd like. And as I am making my way towards the right filling in this large shape, I am going back to where I started to run my paintbrush bristles over that initial area to make sure that everything stays nice and wet. I advance a little bit more towards the right and I go back to that initial area and also to the middle. I advance a little bit more and I go back and so on and so forth so that I can make sure that everything is still nice and wet before I drop in more of my gray into areas that I'm looking to deepen and darken. As I make my way towards the right, I continue working as quickly as possible so that the edges of this gray shape that I'm painting in don't start drying on me. I don't want to be left with sharp defined edges. So whenever you start running out of paint, take your paint quickly from your palette and pick up exactly where you left off right along the edge of that shape, cover up more of that white paper, then go back to where you started and that middle section, then advance a little bit more, then go back, and so on and so forth. All right, so I'm almost done here with this first light layer of gray all throughout the roof portion of the house. And once I'm done here, I'm gonna quickly load up my paintbrush with more of this gray, now taking my gray from that lowest part of these wells, which are sloped so that I can load up more paint in my bristles. And I am just gonna be dropping in more gray into shadow sections or where it would make sense that shadows would be created. So for example, right under the ledge of the roof and under the windows. And you can see how because that underneath layer is still wet, I'm getting nice diffused out soft effects. All right, so right around here, I'm gonna do a tiny bit of cleaning up and lifting while this paint is still wet. For the first time in the process, I bring out my size 10 round brush. It's smaller and will allow for greater control in these sections that I wanna clean up a bit. And all I'm gonna do is use the clean and slightly damp bristles of my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge to lift up some of that excess paint from areas that I wanted to keep a little bit lighter. Because I dropped in more gray while that initial layer was still wet, I had some expanding of that paint into areas that I wanted to keep lighter. So that's why I went in to do some lifting. Lifting is an essential technique to know about and use. Whenever you feel you have dropped in way too much color or water, remove that color from your paintbrush bristles and go in with a clean paintbrush to absorb that excess color slash water off your paper. Or you can also do lifting with your absorbent towel. Going in and doing lifting can really help you clean things up. And it's also great to add dimension back into areas that look a little bit too heavy or too flat. So you do have to do it while that paint is still wet. All right, so I'm gonna continue painting in these black sections of the house with my gray color mixture. I'm gonna continue using my size 10 round brush because I am getting smaller with these shapes that I am painting. And the process is exactly the same. I'm going to be creating an initial light gray layer and then dropping in a little bit more of that gray into sections of shadow that I want to darken. Even though this piece has more of an expressive, looser style and I'm not really going for super high levels of realism with it, I want my piece to show at least somewhat of a range of values at the end in every single area. What I mean is I want whatever color it is that I am using for the area on hand to appear darker in certain sections and to appear lighter in others. This is what's going to help give this piece a sensation of light and shadow and dimension. 
right here, you're going to see me go in with way too much paint slash water in my paintbrush bristles into this relatively small shape. And I fix this by using the lifting technique once again. I quickly remove that color from my paintbrush bristles, remove the excess water by blotting the tips of my bristles on my absorbent towel that I have there on my left, and I go back in and use the bristles of my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge. Check out how easily I was able to remove that excess paint slash water. Painting small shapes can certainly be tricky. You want to make sure that you're going in with a paintbrush size that is going to allow more control in smaller areas. Obviously, the larger the paintbrush, the more water it holds in its bristles, and you can certainly go in with a paintbrush that is too large, and too much water and paint can start coming down into that very small shape, and you start losing control. So A, make sure that you're using a paintbrush that is an appropriate size for the size of shape that you're going to be painting. Usually you also want to make sure that the point comes to a nice fine tip so that you can have more control. And also make sure that you don't load up your paintbrush as much as you would when you are painting a larger area. This said, I would still consider these to be medium sized shapes, not super small shapes. So I am using a medium sized paintbrush, not a super small detailing brush. Because if you go in with a very small detailing brush, like for example, something like a size three or a size one or zero, that is a little bit too small. And you're gonna find that you accidentally create more texture because you have to continue loading up that paintbrush over and over and that paint starts drying on you because again, the smaller the paintbrush, the less amount of paint slash water it's able to load up in its bristles, which means that you have to constantly reload your paintbrush bristles and there will be way more chances that those gray shapes will start drying on you on your paper, which ultimately creates more texture. So just make sure that those smaller, more detailing brushes are used for precisely that the smallest shapes, the details, the textures, and usually I do that until the very end. So I always work from general largest shapes and largest washes, and then I make my way towards medium-sized shapes, and then finally the smallest shapes and details. Okay, so I painted in all of these windows at once with a light translucent watered-down layer of gray, and while those windows were still wet, I dropped in a little bit more gray into certain sections where I wanted to create darker gray values. You don't have to paint them all at once the way that I did. You can certainly work on one window at a time. I think this will make it more likely that you won't have to feel like you're racing against the clock because you can just paint that one shape in and then quickly drop in more of your gray in those sections you want to darken and then move on to the next window. This way you avoid things starting to dry on you. All right, so I finished up with my gray. I took advantage of the fact that I had gray in my paintbrush and painted in other glass sections in the door. After finishing up with the gray, I rinsed out all of the gray from my paintbrush bristles by swiveling my paintbrush in my container of water. And I like doing that a couple of times until I can see that the water that is dripping down my paintbrush bristles is coming down clean before I work with a new color. This way I avoid contaminating my new color with my previous color. And it was time to start painting in the electricity post to the left of this house. And for this, I'm gonna be using my two browns and also a little bit of gray later. Notice how lightly I am painting in the brown initially and how I'm gonna be developing a wide range of brown values even within this secondary element in the piece. So I paint in that very light, pale layer of brown with my lighter brown first, my burnt umber with a little bit of water added in. And while that was still wet, I then dropped in some of my darker brown, which is my burnt umber plus a little bit of neutral tint. And I dropped that into shadow sections. It was then time to paint in the gray in this box on the electricity post. And right here, you're seeing me create more of my gray because I ran out. So you're seeing me once again create a combo of burnt umber plus some ultramarine blue until it looks like a gray on my palette. Right here, I'm swatching this gray out on my scrap piece of watercolor paper to ensure it's the gray that I want. 
and once I'm ready I take just a small amount of paint and you can always add a little bit more water into your color mixture to water it down a little bit more if you feel that it is way too saturated way too thick help yourself by testing out your color and your translucency of your paint on your scrap piece of watercolor paper before going in whenever there is any doubt that the paint is the color that you want but also the translucency level that you want. So I first painted in that light gray layer and I then dropped in a little bit more gray into certain sections that I wanted to darken. Alright, so I was all done with that electricity post. You can see how I didn't even paint the um, upper kind of horizontal shape or rectangle. I didn't paint it in completely because again I want to leave the outer portions of the piece or the edges of the piece free of color, free of paint, or used color in a very pale translucent state the closer I get to the edges. After having painted in that electricity box, I also painted in some other gray details on top of the house. Again, I made sure to use my gray in a pretty watered down state, maybe a tea to coffee like consistency is what I was trying to go for. And then it was time to start doing some deepening and darkening of shadow sections. So watercolor tends to dry lighter than how it looks when it's wet. And when we're trying to develop a more believable sensation of light and shadow, it is worth allowing the piece to dry completely and coming back to it later to see how lightly everything has dried. And then if you want to increase the contrast to add more three-dimensional form and more of a believable shadow look into your piece, you can definitely darken and deepen sections going in on dry paper. So that's exactly what I'm doing right now. I'm using my size 10 round brush and my gray color mixer, and now I'm taking a little bit more paint because I am working on darker midtones and darkest darks. So I'm taking my paint from that lowest section in my well. I can use my paint in a little bit more of a saturated, thicker state at this point. And I'm only going in and doing overlapping over certain sections of shadows that I'm looking to deepen and darken and leaving the other sections of gray that I want to leave as a lighter gray value free of this new layer of paint. I go over most of the shapes that I have added that hatching in when I was doing my pen and ink work. Those shapes that I created my hatching in are darker midtones and darkest dark shapes or shadow areas. I can darken other sections as well that don't have any hatching in them. That is perfectly okay. But I do want to make sure to consider those shadow areas that I was already planning since the pen and ink part of this entire process and darkening those areas. And I've also added in some hatching in shadow sections that I'm going to be developing in those blue walls. That I'm going to be painting in with blue, so I'm just ignoring that for now and focusing on the gray shapes. I'm continuing to carefully paint in all of these dark gray shapes. Right here, I'm going to paint in a small gray shape on top of the door. Right here, I'm going to add a tiny bit of a very, very light gray value along the edges of these cylinders coming out from the house on top. I want those cylinders to look white, like white tubes. So I left some white paper shining through, especially in the center of that cylinder. And I just made sure to use the gray in a very, very pale watered down state, just to develop a little bit of a hint of values in those white cylinders. I then created more of my gray color mixture by adding more ultramarine blue and burnt umber onto my palette. I tested out this gray on my scrap piece of watercolor paper to make sure that it was the gray that I've been using so far. And what I am doing here using my size 10 round brush is I am describing the texture on the roof of the house a little bit more. I'm just very quickly and loosely doing one sideways sweeping stroke. A short one of course. So my intention is not to perfectly paint in all of these rectangular looking marks that I've created before. I am leaving some of these free of this new layer of paint and I'm even adding in a few extra shapes using these strokes. This really helps enhance that brick or stone texture in the roof of the house and brings more detail and interest into that area. Remember that less is more. Okay, so before doing more work in that doorway, I am taking advantage of the fact, once again, that I have gray in my paintbrush 
to do a tiny bit of subtle light gray value development throughout the white detailing around the windows and other sections of the house. I don't want to leave them completely flat white. I do want to develop at least somewhat of a hint of very light gray values, especially in areas where shadows would be underneath little roof portions and that kind of thing. But in order to make sure that these will look like white details or white elements, you have to make sure that you leave plenty of that white paper shining through and that you're using your gray in a very pale, watered down state. Remember, when in doubt, test it out on your scrap piece of watercolor paper. Add more water into your mixture if you have to. If you go in with your gray in a saturated state, those white details are going to end up looking like gray details. Once I was done with that, I removed all of that gray from my paintbrush bristles and I'm going in with that same method for this section around the door. So initially I went in with my size 10 round brush, I painted in that light blue layer and then I dropped in more of this blue in shadow sections that I was looking to push a little bit more while that initial layer was still wet. Once I was done with the blues around the door, it was time to allow those blues to dry before I painted in the door because the door I'm going to be painting with brown and I don't want that brown to start seeping into my blue which is still wet. So I had to allow that to dry so I skipped on over to another section that needed to be painted which is this lower portion of this beautiful section in front of the house that is coming out with the windows. Once I removed all of that blue from my paintbrush bristles I did the exact same thing. I first painted in a light gray layer and then I darkened certain sections by dropping in a little bit more of that same gray. All right, so in order to add in more life into this piece and more color, I decided to bring in a couple of shrubs, one on either side of the house. So I switched on back to my size 10 round brush for this. What I'm doing right here is I'm making sure that my two greens that I created in the beginning of this process are activated on my palette. So I have my lighter green, which is a mixture of my undersea green and hence a yellow light. And I have my darker green, which is plain undersea green with water added in. They were already kind of dry at this point, and so I made sure to bring in a tiny bit of water into them, added more color into them to make sure that I had enough of each and that their consistency was appropriate for the techniques that I would be using. Once I had my lighter green and my darker green ready for me on my palette, it was time to get started with painting in these plants. Always working from lights to darks here, I get started with my lightest green and I go in with a mixture of scribbling and bouncing. I have an entire video in which I share must know watercolor brush strokes and practice drills that I would highly recommend checking out if you haven't already because I explain in depth about scribbling and bouncing and doing those drills as a beginner is so helpful. It allows you to develop mastery over your medium and get comfortable with different ways of holding and using your paintbrush. I'm gonna make sure to leave a link to that tutorial down below in the text section of this one in case you'd like to go and check it out. But essentially what I am doing here is I first went in with my lightest green and while that lightest green was still wet, I dropped in a little bit of my dark darker green in shadow areas to get these nice soft transitions between my green values. And I create these very irregular abstract shapes for these shrubs. Oftentimes when I'm going to be adding in this kind of secondary element into this kind of piece, I don't actually sketch them in with graphite or with pen and ink because I like how it looks when these secondary elements don't actually have any line work developed inside or around them because it creates a looser look as just the paintbrush is creating that shape on its own. And by not having any line work to define those outer edges or create greater detail, it sends these secondary elements back behind the other elements which do have line work and more detail added in. So it adds depth to the piece and interest and balance. You can see how I left little teeny tiny sections of white paper shining through unpainted. And that's very nice because they look like highlights. And I made sure to create a lot of irregularity along the edges of these abstract green shapes for my shrubs. 
After I finished with painting in the shrubs, it was time to paint in the door of the house. And this is a very small, narrow shape. So I changed on over to my size three round brush, which is the smallest brush that I am using for this process. And you guessed it, I am first going in with my lighter brown, which is my plain burnt umber with water added in. And while that initial light brown shape was still wet, I dropped in my darker brown, so my mixture of burnt umber plus a little bit of neutral tint. And I dropped in that darker brown only into shadow sections to make sure that I developed a range of brown values even in this small shape. This smaller detailing brush is perfect for this size of shape. It really allows for more control and I'm going to continue using it for other smaller little uh, sections, shapes, and details that I'm going to be working on next. I decide to paint in the mailbox on the right of this door with gray and also the door handle I paint in with gray. If you fear that the gray is going to start bleeding into that brown that you just painted in, then simply allow that brown to dry completely before you paint in these gray elements right next to the door. These are very teeny tiny shapes that I am painting in, so I'm making sure to only go in with a small amount of paint and water in my bristles so that I don't start losing control. Right here I'm darkening a gray shadow shape right underneath this roof above these windows. And I'm going to go ahead and deepen and darken other shadow areas, creating abstract irregular shapes that are going to be my shadow shapes. So I go ahead and create these dark shadow shapes in other sections in front of the house, focusing on all the gray elements that perhaps have sections that need to be darkened. I'm just making sure to acknowledge all of these shapes that I am painting in right now as abstract, irregular shadow shapes. This helps me stay away from the look of lines and heavy, blocky looking shapes because that can add a lot of flatness to the piece. And this is even more important once we start getting into using our different colors in a darker, more saturated state. Because the darker and more saturated the color, the more likely it is that that shape or that line is going to be even more stark looking and more distracting for the viewer. As I am developing all of these deepest shadow shapes, that really helps me make sure that I'm creating abstract irregular shapes is as I am painting in that shape, sometimes I'm using just the tip of my paintbrush and other times I'm pressing down the belly of my paintbrush a little bit more. And this helps me create a shape that is thinner in some sections and thicker in other sections. So this looks like less of a line and more of an abstract shape. I removed all of that gray from my paintbrush bristles and I'm going in to paint shadow shapes with my blue added in a blue shadow shape right beneath that little roof section above the doorway. I also added in a little shadow shape beneath the mailbox. And just like how adding in those little strokes um, inside and around those marks in the roof really helped me enhance that texture, I'm kind of doing the same thing here for the blue wall of the house. This helps me enhance or describe the long horizontal wooden sections making up this front wall. I am painting long strokes beneath the lines that I created with my ink. And I don't even have to do this below every single line. I skip over some. Notice how subtle that blue is. You really don't have to go in with super dark, very saturated blue in order to describe that texture more. Keeping it subtle is oftentimes best. All right, so just finishing up here with these elongated abstract shadow shapes that I'm adding in front of the house. And finally, it is time to get started with what I would consider to be the very last phase of this painting process, which is adding a subtle hint of background colors. And because I'm going for a vignette style effect, I'm really looking to create organic, irregular uh, edges or shapes all around this house. So I switched on over to my largest paintbrush that I am using for this painting process, which is my size 16 round. Because I am painting in large shapes, these are large washes, and I want to be able to load up my paintbrush well with a good amount of paint and water, and I want to paint these 
areas in nice and quick. This larger brush is also going to help me create those irregular abstract organic edges that I'm looking for. First, I add in a little bit more gray color right under the sidewalk. I initially go in with my gray, which is my burnt umber plus ultramarine blue color mixture in a pretty translucent watered down state. I paint in a very abstract organic gray shape very quickly that is super light. And then while that initial light layer was still wet, I dropped in a little bit more of that gray nearest that last ink line that I created for that sidewalk, meaning right below that ink line because again, it all comes back to wanting the majority of that pigment to be closer to the house, near the center of this piece, and wanting less and less color as I get closer to the edges of the piece. And right now, I am using a very similar method to add in a hint of blue around the house to create that illusion of sky behind the house. I'm going for a relatively pale translucent blue here. I don't want this blue to compete with the blue inside of the house. A little bit of that blue goes a long way. Just a moment ago, I dropped in way too much saturated blue along the top here, and you just saw me a moment ago go in and do a little bit of lifting to remove that excess color. I removed that color from my paintbrush bristles as soon as I saw that I was dropping in way too much, and I went in with my clean and only slightly damp paintbrush to lift up that excess color using the bristles of my paintbrush as a little absorbent sponge. I then dabbed the tip of my paintbrush on my absorbent towel to remove that excess color from my bristles, and then I went in with just a little bit of water in my paintbrush to distribute that remaining pigment that was left on my paper into a larger section which really helped me soften that color. And again if you feel that you need to add more water into your blue to make it paler, more watered down, go ahead and do it before getting started. Load up your paintbrush bristles with a good amount of that watered down color, paint in that large initial light blue shape, then while it's still wet drop in a little bit more of that blue nearest the house right along the edge of the house to darken that area a little bit more. If you're afraid that your large initial shape, the light blue shape, will start drying on you way too quickly, do the same thing that we were doing initially when we were painting in the house and make sure to run the bristles of your paintbrush over the shape several times so that it can stay wet for longer. This way you can make sure that when you drop in more of your blue in those sections nearest the house, you can get nice diffused out effects and gradients between your darker blues and your lighter blues. I tackled these blue areas separately. First I painted in the uh, sky section to the right of the house. I then paint the upper sky section above the house and I am now finishing up with the sky to the left of the house. To get those irregular edges, what I do is I make sure to shift and change the way that I am using my paintbrush. Not only am I going in and doing light scrubbing motions along the edges with just a little bit of water in my paintbrush, but I'm also at times pressing down the belly of my paintbrush in different ways as I am using these different brushes strokes and this helps me create very irregular outer edges. I try to work quick and I do my very best not to start overworking anything. Embrace irregularity, imperfection, and allow that paint to do its own thing. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.